Good morning, it's Pastor Justin here with Hartzell United Methodist Church. So glad you're joining with us again this week as we come together to meet with Jesus. Let us begin this morning with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be able to step into your presence and to allow you to speak your truth into our lives. Whatever it is that might keep us from hearing from you today, Lord, we lay it aside and we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would speak. We know that your word says that though the grass may wither and the flowers may fade, that your word stands forever. And so we ground ourselves on your word today, on that which is eternal. In your name we pray. Amen. Our reading for today comes from the book of Leviticus, chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Let us hear the words of the Lord. When someone brings a grain offering to the Lord, his offering is to be of fine flour. He's to pour oil on it, put incense on it, and take it to Aaron's sons, the priests. The priest shall take a handful of the fine flour and oil, together with all the incense, and burn this as a memorial portion on the altar, an offering made by fire, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. The rest of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the offerings made to the Lord by fire. If you bring a grain offering baked in an oven, it is to consist of fine flour, cakes made without yeast and mixed with oil, or wafers made without yeast and spread with oil. If your grain offering is prepared on a griddle, it is to be made of fine flour mixed with oil and without yeast. Crumble it and pour oil on it. It is a grain offering. If your grain offering is cooked in a pan, it is to be made of fine flour and oil. Bring the grain offering made of these things to the altar. Present it to the priest who shall take it to the altar. He shall take out the memorial portion from the grain offering and burn it on the altar as an offering made by fire, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. The rest of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the offerings made to the Lord by fire. Every grain offering you bring to the Lord must be made without yeast, for you are not to burn any yeast or honey in an offering made to the Lord by fire. You may bring to them the, to the Lord as an offering of first fruits, but they are not to be offered on the altar as a pleasing aroma. Season all your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings. Add salt to your offerings. If you bring a grain offering of first fruits to the Lord, crushed heads of new grain roasted in the fire. Put oil and incense on it. It is a grain offering. The priest shall burn the memorial portion of the crushed grain and the oil, together with all the incense, as an offering made to the Lord by fire. This is the word of God that is spoken for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. It was gratitude. Gratitude that prompted an old man to visit an old, broken-down pier on the eastern seacoast of Florida. Every single Friday night until the day of his death back in 1973, he would return to that pier. And each week, he would bring his bucket filled with shrimp, and the seagulls would all flock around him, and he, they would eat from his bucket. You see, many years before, back in October of 1942, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker was on a mission, a mission to deliver a very important message to General Douglas MacArthur when his plane crashed at sea. They went down in the South Pacific, and for nearly a month, Eddie and the rest of his crew fought the weather and the sea and the waves and the scorching sun. They spent many sleepless nights in fear as sharks rammed their raft. But of all the enemies that they faced out there at sea, the one that was the most dangerous and the most deadly was starvation. You see, after just eight days out there at sea, their rations were completely gone. And hunger was beginning to set in. They knew that it was going to take 
a miracle in order to save them. And so they started to pray. Every morning they began this practice of, of, of worshiping and praying to God, asking for this miracle to come. And one day, right after they finished praying, a seagull landed on the top of Eddie's head. They managed to catch the seagull. They, they killed it. They ate its meat. And then they began to use its intestines as bait to catch fish over the next few weeks so that they were able to have food enough until the day that they were saved, all because of that one lone seagull. And so every Friday night for the next 30 years, Eddie went down to the pier to remember and to, to give thanks, to feed the gulls, because he didn't want to forget that very important gall that saved them all. You know, we all build practices into our lives to help us remember things. You know, some people might tie a ribbon around their finger. Other people might write things on their hands. You know, some people make lists or they set alarms or they make up mnemonic devices in order to help them recall things. Even our holidays that we celebrate every single month are opportunities to remember important things. You know, it was about seven or eight years ago now, Melissa and I had taken the kids down to Disney World and uh, we had spent the day out at the park and, and then we got done and we went out into the parking lot and we saw this massive sea of cars. And, and I remember it vividly because we started to look at these cars and then this sense of dread began to set in. And Melissa and I looked at each other and we both realized the same thing right away. Mm -hmm. Neither one of us knew where we parked. We had absolutely no idea and we knew there was be no way that we'd be able to find it and as large as this parking lot was. And, and so we thought about it for a minute and realized, you know, my in-laws had come into the park about the same time as us. And so we, we called them because they had already left and, and said, you know, what area of the parking lot did you guys park in? So maybe we could find our car if we were able to get close enough. You know, we need reminders because deep down we are forgetful people. I mean, we forget what day it is. We forget where we put our keys. We forget people's birthdays and anniversaries. We forget where we parked our car. We forget to bring home the milk from the store. And sometimes we even go into a room and we get there and we forget why it is we even went into that room. And the same is the case with the life of faith. It's very easy to forget the blessings of God. It's very easy to forget who he is and what he's done and, and the great and mighty ways that he's worked in our lives. Because when things get comfortable in life, it start to, it's very easy to start to forget he's even there. When things get hard or they're difficult, to, we start to wonder if he is there at all, if he really loves us. And when it comes to our giving... Many times we forget that God is the provider of everything that we have. We start to think of ourselves as the owner, ourselves as the one who pulled our, ourselves up by our own bootstraps and enabled ourselves to, to have the wealth that we have. And even though God is a God of abundance and a God of supply who holds the entire world in his hands, sometimes we start to operate from this sense of scarcity and lack. I mean, it happened all the time in the Bible, people forgetting the blessings of God. All the way back in the book of Genesis, God had called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans. He had told him that he was going to make him a great nation, that he was going to give him a son, that he was going to bless all the peoples of the earth through him. And the story, the story starts to unfold, and God blesses Abraham in incredible ways. He, he, he increases his wealth and his flocks and his possessions. But, but 25 years go by, and he still hasn't seen even the single sign of a son. And so he forgets all the things that God has already done. And he decides that he's going to take things into his own hands. And he goes off, and he brings his maidservant in, and he has a son by her instead. We get to the book of Exodus and the story of the deliverance of God's people from slavery in Egypt. God's people had seen God move in mighty ways. They, they had seen his powerful right hand. 
They had seen the ten plagues and how God poured them out upon the Egyptian people, but at the same time had protected the Israelites from their effects. That they had seen God part the Red Sea and deliver them from the mighty hand of Pharaoh. But now they are, here they are, out in the wilderness, and they start to get hungry, and they start to get a little thirsty, and they start to wonder where their help comes from. They forget all that God had done. They finally get to the promised land, and they send 12 people into the land to spy it out. And, and they go in, and the people there look like giants in their eyes. They, they, they see all their fortified, fortified walls. And they start to wonder, maybe God has brought us here to die. I mean, just get this. They have just defeated the largest, most powerful army that the world had ever seen in the people of Egypt. But they get to these small cities, and they start to wonder if they can even win. They forget the blessings of God. They finally get into the land, and they settle down, and they start to build homes, and Life begins to get very comfortable, and once again, they forget that God is with them. They start to go their own way. They start to do their own things. They start to turn to other gods and set up idols and mountaintop worship sites. I mean, in many ways, the entire story of the Old Testament centers around this one thing. God does something, and then the people forget, and they go out. And they rebel against him. And, and, and they repent. And God does something. And then they forget again. Over and over and over. It's the story that we see in the scriptures. We see it in the New Testament as well. One of my favorite stories. The feeding of the 5,000. Where God shows up in this powerful and mighty way. He feeds 5,000 men plus women and children. With just five loaves of bread. And a few fish. And then two chapters later. Another crowd is gathered, and this time the Bible tells us that there are 4,000 men plus women and children, and they have seven loaves of bread. In other words, there are less people, and there's more food, but the disciples still have no idea how they're going to feed these people. <laughs> and then the very next episode, they're in a boat. There's just the 12 of them now. They have one loaf of bread, and they're still wondering how in the world they're going to have enough to go around. Over and over and over again, we forget how God has worked. I mean, it's no wonder that the Bible tells us to remember 233 times. God is constantly calling us to remember. He's implementing laws and feasts and sacraments and sacrifices so that we remember who God is. We remember what God has done so that we don't forget the ways that he's worked. I mean, that's really what the, these sacrifices were all about because every time they brought a sacrifice to God, they were reminded that God is dwelling in the middle of their camp. That he is among them. They, they were reminded of his blessings. They were reminded of the ways that he had provided for them to that day. Over these last few weeks, we've been in this series called A Pleasing Aroma. And we've been exploring the sacrifices in the book of Leviticus, looking at what they have to say to us today about this topic of stewardship. The sin offering taught us that stewardship starts by responding to the grace of God. The burnt offering taught us that stewardship is about surrendering every area of life. And last week, in the fellowship offering, we learned to bring our relationships to the Lord. Because sacrifice and offering alone is not what God desires. What He desires is a heart that is willing to forgive. Uh, a willingness to love and to care for people. You see, if, if anything is true about these sacrifices that we've been talking about, is that nothing we do is insignificant to God. Everything matters. In fact, nothing is secular. Everything is sacred. Everything is holy to the Lord. Every single area of our life. And so today we're turning to the grain offering, and the grain offering is really about work, right? It's about the fruit of our labor. 
Because if you'll notice, the, the thing that made this sacrifice so different from every other sacrifice that we've talked about is that it wasn't a sacrifice of blood. Right? They didn't sacrifice an animal for this thing. It was a sacrifice of grain. A sacrifice from the field. That's why it's called the grain offering. They're to bring fine flour and oil with incense and salt on it. It was a sacrifice of the field. And, and I think we... We miss how significant that is because our world isn't really built around the field much anymore. Right? Our, our world is built around factories and business and production and uh, where, where the primary mediums are cash and checks and credit cards and PayPal, Venmo, Bitcoin. Right? It, it, it's all of these kinds of things, but their world was built entirely on the field. It was built on grain. That was how they paid for things. They, they paid with, uh, with resources, and they would trade those things. And, and so their, their livelihood was built on the crops that they could produce every year. If they had a bad season or the weather was bad, they, they not only didn't have income for their families, but they couldn't put food on the table either. And so I think what God wants us to see here is there, there are two things, really, I want to highlight about this grain offering. It's the first is this. It had to come from the first fruit of the harvest. The first fruit. Which meant that it came off the top. It was the, the offering that was to be made from the very first harvest of the season. I mean, and the amazing thing about this, they didn't know what the rest of the harvest was going to look like. right? They didn't know if... The, the next few weeks were going to produce well or they were going to produce poorly. They didn't know if they were going to have a drought later on. They didn't know uh, what was going to happen with their yield. But yet God says to bring it from the very first harvest of the year because it was ultimately not about what they brought. It was about the faith that it displayed, the trust, the dependence on God to provide for the rest of the year. They, they, they were to, to do this because they, wanted, they were to remember that God is faithful. And if they give now, he will still provide tomorrow. He didn't want them to wait and see how much they got and then say, well, I need this much for my family and this much to eat and then give the leftovers to God. He didn't want them to do that. He wanted them to give off the top. I mean, just think of it this way. You have a really great meal. You eat, you have your fill, there's some leftovers, and so you stick it in the fridge for the night, and the next day you get it back out, and somehow it just doesn't look as good. Right? It doesn't taste quite as good as it did the night before. I mean, we don't like leftovers, and, and God doesn't like leftovers any more than we do. And the reason for that is because it doesn't require faith. If we, if we knew everything that we were going to get for the whole season long, it doesn't require faith. Right? It had to come off the top because only the top requires trust and faith in God. Leviticus 27.30 says it this way, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the tree, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. And in the Hebrew, that word tithe literally means the first tenth or ten percent. It's the, the minimum standard that God declares is necessary for our trust and faith in Him. Why? Because He wants to teach us to grow in dependence on Him. I mean, I think back to the very first experience that I had with tithing. I started tithing when I was in college. And, and at first it really wasn't that hard because I didn't really have a lot of bills, right? My parents were still paying, you know, most of my college expenses and all those kinds of things. But once I graduated from college and I went off to seminary, that's when it started to get hard. Uh, we, Melissa and I had just got married. Uh, we started seminary about eight to 10 days after we got married. We were both in school together. We were both only working part-time jobs, and yet we had our rent, and we had uh, to put food on the table. We had to pay our utilities. We had all this stuff that we had to do, plus the books that we had to buy for school. And I remember that we sat down, and we started to talk about 
what's it going to look like to give? Um, are we going to have enough? <laughs> because we, we knew we had all these expenses coming up. And, and so we made the decision that we were still going to keep giving that first 10%, no matter what happened. And, and so uh, we did that. And then this, this miraculous thing happened. Uh, we received a check in the mail. And it was a check from this couple. They had told us they were going to send a check. But the check was double what they told us was going to come. And then the next month came. And there was a check. And it was double what they said it was going to come. And the third month came. And it was double what they said they were going to come. It was just enough to cover what we needed. And that experience really stretched my trust and my dependence on God. I really learned a lot. And so each and every year as we come to these campaigns, one of the things that I always do when I reflect on is this one question, what, what one step do I need to take to trust God a little bit more than I am right now? How, how do I personally need to grow? Because the thing is that if you want your faith to increase, you have to step out in faith. You have to take a leap of faith that, that there is growth in the stretch as we Learn to trust God more and more and more. And that's why I think God wants it to be from the top, from the first fruit, because it only that demands our faith and our trust. If we wait till the end when we got everything figured out, it doesn't take any faith at all. And so I wonder, as you're looking at your own giving today, does it stretch you? Does it grow you? Does, does it require any faith at all? I mean, are, are you giving off the top or are you tipping God and and giving from what's left over at the very end of the day now, the second thing I want us to see in this from this text is it had to be the most time intensive stuff to produce I mean, we're told that the grain offering has to be a sacrifice of fine flour mixed with oil we're said told this nine times in the 16 verses of this text and I think we miss how significant that really is because we just go down to Kroger and, and we get a bag of fine flour and we get a bottle of oil. They're pretty much standard items in every single house in the country today. But in that day, they were rare. They were expensive and time intensive to produce. They were very hard to find. You see, flour had to be made from from wheat it was threshed and then it would be grinded between the stones and and sifted into fine flour and, and that took a long time to do and so most of the time it would only be ground until it was rough flour because it just took too long to accomplish and in the same way most olives or, or most oil in that day was olive oil uh, which meant they made it from olives and each and every olive only gives off a drop or two of oil, but to get enough oil to drench the flour uh, in this kind of way would take a long time to produce. You see, it's not just the sacrifice itself that's important, it's the process that's critical. It's the time that it takes to produce it because it's supposed to take a while, so they have time to sit back and think and reflect and remember who God is. Remember his faithfulness. Remember his blessings. Remember what he's done to this point in their life to give them the things that they have. Leviticus calls it a memorial portion. A memorial portion, which means that its purpose is to help us remember. It's to jog our memory about who God is and how much God has done for us in the way that he's provided. The process itself is is a part of the gift. And I think this is radical because we don't tend to think of, of giving in this kind of way as, as something we remember. We, we think of giving more as a kind of a task-oriented thing, something that we, that we need, that we give because the church needs to pay its bills. We, we give because someone's hungry and they need to be fed. We, we give because we need to do this ministry or we need to send the kids to camp or whatever it is. We, there, there's always... We're giving for a thing or a purpose or a reason, but, but we don't think about it in terms of we give so we can remember something. That, that we give so we can remember and bring to mind who God is and what God has done in our life. And so every time as we're putting money in that plate or, or, or we're giving online or wherever it is we're giving, we should be stopping and thinking about 
how much God has blessed us with. Leviticus effectively says that we need to give. We need to give because we need to be reminded. We need to be reminded that God is a God of abundance. We need to be reminded that he's a God of supply. We need to be reminded of his provision in our lives. That God sets aside this first 10% as his own, not because he needs the money, but because we need some very physical tangible reminders of God's ownership and God's provision in our lives to effectively grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. And, and that's because, you know, giving is a very foreign concept to most of us. You know, we, we tend, um, for the most part, to be savers, hoarders, possessors, spenders, people who consume and buy and purchase things. We go to work so we can make money to buy stuff and give us a a certain quality of life and living. And, and so we start to think about ourselves as the owner, ourselves as the provider, ourselves as the one who has to get it done. Right? We talk about it as if it's our money, our home, our car, our this, our that, rather than seeing ourselves as stewards and managers of God's good and perfect gifts. Now just imagine for a moment, you, you got your weekly paycheck and and, and you, you go down to the bank, you deposit it with them. And when you do that, there's this implicit idea behind it that you're trusting them to manage and to care for your money. But, but then maybe something happens in your life a week later, you need some money. And so you go back to the bank and, and, and you want to withdraw some cash. And the moment you walk in, the cashier, cashier says, oh, no, you're here. You're, you're going to have to go talk to the manager of the bank. And so you go into the bank manager's office. And he says, you know, I, I know you wanted to make your withdrawal today. You needed some money, but we, we just don't have it. You see, the wife and I, we kind of fell behind on some of our bills. And so we decided to use some of your money to, to pay for that. And, you know, how would you respond? You know, maybe you would be irate. Maybe you get angry. Maybe you cuss them out. Maybe you even call the police because the bank stole your money. But, you know, that's what we tend to do with God. You know, Malachi says that we have robbed God in our tithes and our offerings, that God is the owner. He is the provider of everything that we have. But we start to think of ourselves as the owner, that we can use the money how we want to use it. And, and rather than actually seeing ourselves as managers. And so let me be really clear here. God, God doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. The, the what you do with your money and your resources is a symbol of what's in your heart. It demonstrates what you really believe about God and his ability to provide for your life. I mean, every piece of money we have says these four words on it. In God, we trust. In God, we trust. But the real question is this. Do we really trust him to provide? Or do we trust ourselves? in our own ability. You know, next week is Consecration Sunday, and as a part of that service, you're going to be challenged to make a faith commitment in response to God's grace. And so this week, I want you to take some time to actually just sit down and to pray, to prayerfully ask, what does God want you to do to stretch your faith just a little bit? You know, for some of you, that mean, might mean you're going to begin giving for the very first time in your life. For others, maybe you're going to take one step up toward that tithe, that first 10% that God has called us to give. For others, maybe you're going to start tithing for your the very first time in your life. You know, maybe there are others of you who are already doing that, but God's going to call you to stretch yourself even further and to take a step up from there to go beyond the minimum standard of Scripture. You know, maybe there are others where God will say, you need to consider putting the church in your will or in your estate planning. Well, whatever it is, I want to challenge you to simply be obedient. To prayerfully say, God, how do you want me to stretch my faith and my trust in you this year? So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. We are so grateful for who you are. We're grateful for the ways that you challenge us to be your people. And so this week, as we are prayerfully considering what you're calling us to do, 
We ask that you would speak clearly to us and that we would have the ears to hear. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Just a couple announcements as we are heading out today. Remember, on November the 21st, we are going to be having our art show. Dave Dennis is going to be showing some of his artwork off. And if you uh, want to purchase any of that, the, the proceeds are going to be going towards missions. And then on the 27th of November, we're going to get together to hang up the greens around the church and decorate for Christmas at 10 a.m. We hope you join us for that as well. Until then, we'll see you next week. God bless.